What up, cuckolds? It's your boy, the hater, up in this piece. And I wanted to make a video about the bloodline. I've already gotten several emails about the rent mania, you know what I'm saying? So keep them coming, write it in the comments, do whatever you like, you know what I'm saying? We have plenty of things to talk about already, but there's always room for more. Now, that being said, let's talk about the bloodline a little bit, all right? So everyone is saying that the bloodline is one of the best storylines of all time. I have an issue with this for two reasons. Number one, we say this about everything. Oh, this is the best thing of all time, and it often is not. This is another example of this strange phenomenon. Think about it. What is the difference between the bloodline and evolution, right? It's presented exactly the same way. There's one guy who's on top, and then other people continuously try to challenge him when this guy gets a little too authoritative. The only difference, well, there's two differences that are noteworthy, but in my opinion, add nothing, and in my opinion, also take away something. The first difference is that the bloodline is an actual family, but because this is wrestling, it doesn't really matter. It's not been presented as if like Roman Reigns somehow has a closer bond inherently with Jey Uso than Triple H did with Ric Flair, let's say, right? In the context of the storyline, the bonds are always the same, right? A ta no tag team has a stronger bond than another tag team, unless that tag team's gimmick is that they don't get along, like MJF and Adam Cole, for example, right? So. Taking that away, what is the difference? Well, I'll tell you. The difference is Evolution had Randy Orton, Batista, and Ric Flair, and Bloodline has Jimmy Uso, Jay Uso, and Solo Sokoa. That's the difference, right? The difference is one faction is full of jobbers, and the other one is full of legends. So with that being said, when Randy Orton betrays Triple H, it's more meaningful than when Jay Uso betrays Roman Reigns. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, when Randy Orton did this, he already was the WWE Champion when he was kicked out, right? The WWE World Heavyweight Champion or whatever, right? The point is he was already entering that phase of his career where he's going from jobber, mid-carder, to main eventer, right? Whereas Jey Uso is still a jobber. They can call him main event Jey Uso all they want. This doesn't change the fact that he is still the same boring Jey Uso that we've always had, right? Now, with that being said, what is this going to lead to? Absolutely nothing. The only thing that this could lead to is everyone leaving Roman Reigns and Roman Reigns still being the champion, right? People are like, oh, one day Solo Sokoa will turn on Roman Reigns. And so what? None of these guys are going to beat WWE champions unless there's another hijacking movement of the fans being like the same way they did with Sami Zayn, right? You knew as soon as the bloodline started, you knew it because it was in the introduction, right? Everyone was against Roman Reigns and they fell in line. What's going to happen is this. They're all going to lose. And Roman Reigns is going to be by himself. And at WrestleMania, or whenever, maybe WrestleMania, he's going to lose his, his title, right? I really don't think... I, first of all, the fact that Jimmy Uso and Jay Uso are now legitimately in the main event. Like, Jay Uso is going to be in the main event of SummerSlam. That's just ridiculous, right? It's just absurd. The example that I always give would be, like, if Stone Cold beat The Undertaker for the title, and then the next guy to wrestle him was Crash Hawley or Devon Dudley because they're part of a tag team that people like. You know what I mean? That doesn't make any sense. You know, this is actually something that is, in my opinion, I wouldn't say ruining Roman Reigns' title reign because his title reign is so long that it can't be ruined. But the idea is this. It's like, I don't care if he has 30 defenses, 50 defenses, if seven of them are against Jimmy Uso or Jey Uso, right? Because you know it's not going to stop here, right? This is going to be like his storyline for the foreseeable future until it's time for him to enter a real storyline again, right? And I really do believe that what's going to happen is this whole bloodline thing, everyone's going to fall apart, including Sol Sokoa eventually, and they're eventually going to have Roman Reigns beat all of them, and then it'll be around January at this point, and then the Royal Rumble will start, and there you have it. Maybe Jey Uso will get another shot at the Royal Rumble, you know, and then eventually... Whoever wins the Rumble is going to go after Roman Reigns probably, right? Or Cody Rhodes is going to do something else, and it's probably going to be him at this point because they haven't really pushed anybody else thus far, right? Mm -hmm. I know people are thinking, oh, what about Gunter? What about him? He's not going to be in the main event next WrestleMania. He's going to be wrestling like Sheamus probably, the same thing as, as last WrestleMania. So that being said, the bloodline to me is overrated, right? Now, I understand another part of the reason why people like the bloodline is because there's emotion behind it. Well, it's an emotional storyline, hater. Yeah, it, 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 it plays up to our emotions. Why? You knew what was going to happen, right? And, and the answer to this, I think, is because in the middle of the match, any kind of bloodline-related match that's not them against somebody else, if there's any kind of like Jey Uso versus Roman Reigns or anything like that, 
there's always like dialogue in the middle of the match. Like they stop fighting, they grab each other's hair and they say, I loved you, you know what I mean? And this is like, all right, once in a while, like for example, in Shawn Michaels versus Ric Flair, all right, you can tolerate that once in a while because, okay, that's like a big deal. It's Ric Flair, it's Shawn Michaels, it's the end of one's career. You know, it's an epic match, it's an epic event, right? It's at WrestleMania. You know, you can make some, ex uh, some uh, exceptions to this rule of no talking during wrestling. But when the entire match is just one move conversation, one move conversation, it's like, what the hell am I watching? You know what I mean? I'm supposed to be watching a wrestling match. But because the Usos have what I call the Samoan moveset, they have like five moves, you can't, they're not really conducive to having long matches. You know, the Usos are there to have short matches. That's why they're a tag team, because they both have the same exact moves. So there's nothing to look forward to. One of them's going to do a super kick, then the other one's going to do a super kick. One's going to go for a splash, then the other's going to go for a splash. So what exactly is it that we're watching? You understand what I'm saying? That's kind of my, my whole problem here, is that people seem to just give the Usos and the Bloodline a pass. Let's call it what it is. This is the same things happening, for example, with Austin Theory and Pretty Deadly, right? Oh, Kit, Kit Wilson turned on Austin Theory. Who cares? Right? Of course they're going to turn on him. Every, every faction in wrestling history, almost every faction in wrestling history, ends with someone turning on someone. Right? So how is this any different than anything else? Right? Now the storyline itself, the execution, in my opinion, has also been lackluster. Right? Especially the Sami Zayn part. Because it's like, dude, as soon as Sami Zayn was there, you knew. You knew, like, you knew that Sami Zayn is not good enough to become WWE Champion. So you knew that him and a partner would, would go after the Usos or he would go after Sol Sokoa. Those are the only viable options for the end of the storyline. So if you can expect it, if you know it, how good is it, right? One of the things that I thought was very well done in, I guess, relatively recent memory, even though it's been like 10 years, is the shield, right? They did it very well, where you were expecting Dean Ambrose was gonna be the guy to turn, right? Or Roman Reigns was gonna beat up Dean Ambrose because he was like talking too much, right? They instead solidified the Ambrose-Roman Reigns bond when they had Seth Rollins turn which really was an unexpected surprise, right? Because it looked at that point that Seth Rollins would be lost in the shuffle. But instead, he's the one that came out on top of that storyline. Yeah, Roman Reigns eventually won the title against Dean Ambrose, and then Dean Ambrose won the title too, but Seth Rollins was the star that was made from that, right? That was good because it was unexpected. But there were differences, right? In that situation, you had three guys that could somehow feasibly all become world heavyweight champion. In fact, they all did. You had three guys that WWE kind of saw, at least a little bit, as main eventers, even though I didn't agree, right? With all that being said, that difference between, um, what's it called? Uh, the Shield, what did I say earlier? Whatever, The Shield, the difference between The Shield and The Bloodline centers around the fact that in The Bloodline you have a bunch of jobbers. So it doesn't really matter how much, you know, Jey Uso revolts, right? He should be treated like Jey Uso. For those of you that have been watching wrestling for a long time, you may remember the Ministry of Darkness, which was Undertaker's mega stable of like nine people, right? Three of those people were their own stable, The Brood, Christian, Edge, and Gangrel. The storyline was that Christian lost a match and Undertaker deemed him too weak uh, to be part of The Brood. So he was gonna sacrifice Christian. And then Gangrel and Edge decided to side with Christian because he's like their brother or whatever, and they're kind of like their own group first, right? And then The Brood feuded with the Ministry of Darkness. But Gangrel didn't go and fight Undertaker on pay-per-view, right? Because Gangrel is Gangrel. Edge is Edge and Christian is Christian. Instead, it was them three against like Midian and the Acolytes or something, right? A much more reasonable pairing, right? A much more reasonable pairing in terms of card order. The fact is, it doesn't matter if the Usos have had the tag team titles for a long time. The tag team titles are basically meaningless, right? The tag team titles, Deuce and Domino, were tag team champions, right? It doesn't mean anything. You know, transitory teams have become tag team champions. It's like the women's title, right? It's like, if you're a woman and you've never been women's champion, then you just suck ass. It's as simple as that. If you're a tag team and you've never had the tag team titles, you're just a shit tag team, right? Who hasn't had the tag team titles? Like everyone, everyone has been tag team champion, right? You look through the roster, it's like 90% of the wrestlers have been tag team champion or they're gonna be tag team champion. So. There's no prestige in being the tag, the tag champion, and the sure as shit is no prestige in Solo Sokoa being the, whatever, the North American champion in NXT. That being said, I think the storyline is overrated, and in my opinion, it's played its course. And, the most important part, this storyline has served as kind of like a stop to Roman Reigns' uh, greater story, which is 
he's the most dominant champion in the company his in the company's history, right? If every once in a while Roman Reigns gets an easy title defense against Jey Uso, I know they're presented as difficult, but they're like unreasonable, right? You know Roman Reigns is gonna win. So every time it's presented like this, it's like what's the point? Now I will say this: the WWE has done a good job of fooling the average fan into thinking that Jey Uso has a chance, and if somehow the 1% chance happens where someone decides that Jey Uso is going to become the next champion, I highly doubt it's going to be at SummerSlam. But if, for example, at SummerSlam, Jey Uso gets this like insane Kofi Mania level type reaction, then at the next pay-per-view or in a few pay-per-views, they might finally give it to Jey Uso. I personally believe if this happens, the ratings are going to be cut in half because I do not see how someone can tune in to a pay-per-view or even a SmackDown and accept Jey Uso as the champion. Jey Uso, the champion, the world champion. Devon Dudley, the world champion. Crash Hawley, the world, the world champion. But I will give credit where credit's due. If WWE pulls the swerve, I certainly won't expect it because as I just said, this jobber should never be WWE champion. But if he is, I will, be, I will have been swerved, which I like. Um, however, even the swerving of fans like me it's not worth it, obviously, if you're going to lose half your audience uh, with Jey Uso as the world champion. You know, I don't care if Jey Uso's out there every Monday and every Tuesday, every Wednesday, on NXT, every Elevation, every Dynamite. If he goes to Dynamite, I don't care if he's there defending title every time. He's still Jey Uso. You can call him main event Jey Uso because you can't call him jobber ass Jey Uso. But the truth is the truth, right? It doesn't even make sense storyline-wise. Just because this guy stood up to Roman Reigns, he gets a title shot? What the hell is that all about, right? So there you go, motherfucks. That's my thoughts on that, bitches.